What have you been up to since we saw you last? <laughs> Well, thank you for the opportunity to flog my own book. Um, sorry, uh, let me phrase that differently. Actually, something that I was working on while I was here in England uh, two years ago was a book on Go, which was published shortly after I returned. Uh, most of the work, I would say almost entirely, uh, the entire part of the work was done by Alan Donovan, a colleague from uh, Google. He's in New York now, but he in fact grew up in Salisbury. So Alan and I wrote this book on Go, which is in many ways a very interesting, useful language. I would not call myself a, a Go expert at all, in spite of having worked on it in this sense. Uh, Alan is the true expert, uh, but worth doing. The other thing that I also did, um, in part because I was on sabbatical for a year, was to update a book that I wrote maybe six, seven years ago called Dias for Digital. It's a book for very non-technical people. Uh, people whose interest and expertise is not in computing but in other things, but who would like to understand, you know, how do these things work? How, what does it mean to write a program? What does it mean to use the web? How does the internet work? What kinds of risks are there to our privacy and security? All kinds of good things like that. So I had written a, a book uh, on that several, you know, at least five or six, seven years ago uh, like that. and. It was getting a little dusty because things change rapidly, and so I did a second edition of that. And the other thing I had done, and probably because of my colleague Dave Brailsford, the first book self-published. He will, I'm sure, tell you that self-publication is a recipe for having things disappear without a trace. And so that the first edition did sort of disappear without much trace. The second edition was published by Princeton University Press, who also has an arrangement with uh, Oxford University Press. And so I'm hopeful that the book gets a lot more uh, publicity. It's called Understanding the Digital World, which is a much fancier title, but OK. Um, so that's the, that's the updated version of that's the, the digital. <clears throat> yeah. I'm actually intrigued to know, because we started Computer File maybe four <clears throat> years ago. What has changed that you had today? What sorts of things? I think the most obvious one, um, the first version was done, I think, in 2011. In 2013, uh, Edward Snowden revealed something that people had suspected but not really realized just how extensively they are being spied on by various government agencies like the NSA in the United States and uh, GCHQ in England and presumably similar ones everywhere in the world. Um, and what Snowden did was to make it crystal clear that there was an enormous amount of that stuff going on in spite of denials and in spite of uh, legal restrictions uh, in various countries on how information could be collected and used. And so that was a big thing. I think the other thing that sort of parallels it in some sense another change is the uh, continuing growth of commercial surveillance, how we are being monitored uh, continuously uh, as we use the internet and our phones and so on by companies like Google and Facebook and who knows who else. Uh, and the enormous growth of the hidden advertising market there, the, the trackers that watch you when you use your uh, computers and when you use your phones. And then in some sense the commercialization of uh, criminal threats against you, that, this is, that uh, people are out to get your money and your identity. Uh, in a way that was, I think, much less so. It was more amateur six, seven years ago than it is today. So all of these are things that are, I think, substantially different, mostly in intensity. They're much worse. Uh, defenses are harder to come by, although uh, we do understand something about that. So that was the bulk of the, of the sorts of things that changed in it. And then, of course, some of it was just trying to clean up the places where I explained it poorly the first time around. Let's see if we could do better the second time around. You keep trying it until you get it right. I, there are authors who claim that they write their stuff right the first time and it never needs work. I don't think that applies to most people and certainly does not apply to me. So even in the process of writing a book, you work really, really hard over and over and over again on, on what you say. And then uh, you get it out and you realize there's a mistake or you could have said that much better or something has changed underfoot and uh, so what you said is no longer accurate because the world has changed around you. So you pile enough of those effects on in a field like computing, which is changing rapidly. Uh, and it means that books tend to date relatively quickly. And so some parts, you know, binary numbers work the same way today as they did when, I don't know, George Boole was at them. And, but uh, the explanations of those perhaps could be improved and the reasons why you should care about them may have changed as well. So that's the genesis of the second edition. 
when you come over here, you don't fly, do you? And I, I don't want to go into the details of this, but I'm interested what it's like spending days on the ocean in this day and age <laughs> when you're so used to being connected. And can you tell me a little bit about that? Oh, oh yeah. I, the genesis, uh, my wife does not like to fly at all. Um, and we are at a stage where fortunately we can take a relatively long period in the summer. So we have three times now we're in, you know, in the middle of the third time, have come to England on the QM2, which fortunately sails from New York, which is you know 50 miles from where we live, and lands in Southampton, which is perfectly fine. And so uh, the trip t takes seven days, and you're in the middle of the Atlantic, and there isn't a lot to do out there, except the QM2 itself is a very big floating, not quite luxury, but close to a hotel in some ways. And they try to entertain their guests and they certainly feed their guests really well. There's lots of good food continuously uh, and uh, entertainment put on of one sort or another. And they have a library and so on and so on. But the other thing, and really your question is, you're cut off from electronics uh, and so on. And it turns out, to my surprise, you're not really. What they provide is satellite internet. You have to pay for it, but my wife and I have sailed enough now that they give us 120 minutes free over seven days. So you can figure this is approximately 20 minutes a day of internet connectivity. Um, and so I use that to check mail, and I found that typically I only use about half of it. I log in, check my mail uh, in, you know, two, three minutes, maybe kill off one important thing if there is one, and then just turn it off again. And I don't miss it a bit. Uh, it works well for me because I don't use a fancy mailer. I am using uh, an old-fashioned text-only mailer, Alpine. And so the fact that the latency is infinite doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> infinite latency. <laughs> Some laughing in the room. Enough. Yes, right. Um, so it turns out that you can get along <clears throat> very nicely without connectivity for a week. Right? if you have more or less arranged your affairs properly before you set off and, and have told people, you yeah, I'm not going to respond to you. So. I'm guessing you still work, though, at that time. You're still working. It's just lack of connectivity. Yeah, right. You can still do things. It, it, it's actually very nice for uh, doing things like editing books or something like that, where you have all the text on your own computer and you can fiddle with it and then uh, at the end resync with the world when you arrive. <laughs> Fantastic. And what's next then, Brian? What's, gonna, what's next for you? Uh, what are you going to be doing? Are you staying in the UK for a while? Or? Yeah, we'll be in the UK until the beginning of August, and then we go back on the QM2. So um, we're in uh, staying in Lincoln at this point, which is a town we hadn't spent enough time in the past. And then we're going off into Yorkshire for a while, and then into northwest Wales, and then down to uh, Ilfracombe, and then down to Dartmouth, and back into Salisbury, and then home. So kind of a week at a time. Oh, and there's an Oxford in there somewhere as well, I forgot. <laughs> so, so to us in the UK, that's quite a big journey, but perhaps when you're from the States, it, it feels not so far. <laughs> uh, in terms of distances, distances in England are tiny. Uh, in terms of travel time, distances in England are very long. <laughs> it took me an hour and a half to get from Lincoln to Nottingham this morning, and I think the distance there is, what, 30 or 40 miles? So because the roads are narrower and there are a lot of people on them.